and welcome to today's virtual launch of International Ideas discussion paper, Democracy and Challenges of Climate Change. It is a great pleasure for International Idea and for me personally to finally be able to present this important paper, which in many ways lays the foundation for International Ideas continued work on democracy and climate change. This is a priority area for our Institute. I'm also very glad that we can launch this report today in the presence of its main author, Dr. Daniel Lindvall. Daniel is a sociologist and senior researcher at Uppsala University's Climate Change Leadership Institute and was the lead researcher of the Swedish government's 2014 Democracy Inquiry, among many other associations and appointments that, he, that, that he's had. He embodies the rare combination of someone who is an expert on both topics, democracy and climate change as well as the nexus between them. Thank you, Daniel, both for your excellent work on this paper and for attending today's launch in person. Joining us online, we have an equally eminent panel composed of Ambassador Jan Wahlberg, Ambassador for Climate Change at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Finland, Ms. Elizabeth Wathuhi, founder of the Green Generation Initiative and Sustainability Analyst at Sustainable Square in Kenya, and Dr. Julia Leininger, Chair of Program Transformation of Political Disorder, Institutions, Values, and Peace at the German Development Institute and member of International Ideas Board of Advisors. Now, you may ask yourselves why would an institute dedicated to supporting and advancing democracy, such as international idea, make climate change a priority for its work? And I'll give you the simple answer, because we must. Climate change is an existential threat, not just for life on the planet, but also for democracy. For one, well over half of emissions of greenhouse gases come from democracies. So democracies need to increase the pace of their transitions towards net zero societies. But just as importantly, if democracies fail to act in the face of an existential crisis, their own futures are at risk. What use is a political system that is unable to protect the survival of humankind and retain the planet's life-supporting ecosystems. The ability to respond effectively to the climate crisis is a test case for democracy's worth as a political system. If democracies fail in this, the case for the virtues of authoritarian systems to deal efficaciously with major crises will be immensely advanced. And until now, despite the fact that democracies are not performing nearly as well as they should when it comes to climate change, the picture is rather clear. Nine out of the 10 top performers in the 2021 Climate Change Performance Index are democracies. Sweden tops the list of 57 countries. China is in a modest 30th place. The reasons for this are not hard to explain. Democracies allow for the free flow of information that enables policymakers to debate and find solutions and for civil society to mobilize. It is no coincidence that Greta Thunberg helped spark a global movement from a lone street demonstration in Sweden, not far from here. It is not random that the global push for climate change litigation, often brought forth by young people, is happening in all cases where independent judges can hold governments and powerful private actors to account, as we have seen recently in Germany and the Netherlands. Democracies are simply more effective against climate change for the same reasons that they don't experience famines. As the Indian economist, Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, suggested long, long ago. 
because in allowing freedom of expression, a vibrant civil society, regular elections, and the workings of checks and balances, they increase the likelihood that crisis will be met and destructive policies corrected. Leveraging the assets of democracy to fight climate change is a way to improve the prospects of democracy's future, today under a cloud of doubt, but it's also a way plainly of helping to protect life on the planet and our own future as a species. For us at International IDEA, this means that we put climate change front and center in all of our work and integrate it as a cross-cutting issue in everything we do. From our support to efficient parliaments, to inclusive electoral and constitution building processes, and in the analysis of our global state of democracy reports. Through this work, we aim to develop knowledge and identify tangible solutions to equip democracies to successfully tackle the climate crisis. And let me just give you a few examples of what I mean. At our global conference on parliaments and climate change organized by our EU supported project Interpares last May, we shared a wide range of examples of how parliaments around the world are working to deal with the climate emergency, particularly by enhancing intergenerational justice, embracing environmentally conscious budgeting policies, and holding governments to account for delivering on climate change agendas. Our constitution building program has also gathered a lot of expertise on the role that constitutions play in ensuring effective environmental protection and enshrining incentives towards sustainable policies and intergenerational justice. And this is only the beginning. The report we're launching today aims to further connect the dots between democracy and climate change, two critical issues for our future whose discussion has been kept largely apart, which to tell you the truth, I find a little baffling. The timing of this effort couldn't be more right. Next week, the world's leaders will gather in Glasgow for COP26, for what many are describing as the world's best last chance to get runaway climate change under control. Based on the most recent action plan submitted by 191 countries to curb greenhouse gas emissions, the planet is on track to warm by more than 2.7 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, far above what world leaders have said is the acceptable upper limit of global warming. These facts underlie the urge, underline the urgency with which we will need to approach the discussions on the role of how democracies can effectively pursue climate action. How do the questions we're asking today connect to the COP26 program? The COP26 program speaks clearly about the need for countries to focus on youth and public empowerment to succeed. It also underlines the need to make progress on gender equality and the full and meaningful participation of women and girls in climate action. To me, both these urgent tasks are best achieved by and within democracies, by strengthening the democratic processes and institutions. Moreover, our panel discussion today will highlight two other highly relevant aspects ahead of the COP. The need for democratic innovation and democratic leverage. This means posing and trying to answer two questions. First, how can democracies best leverage the advantages that characterize their democratic decision making, such as representative parliaments, civic participation, independent media, and free flow of information? And second, what innovation policies and actions are available to democracies to successfully implement more ambitious climate action required to meet their commitments in the Paris Agreement. We will, we will thus zoom in on how such reforms can help overcome the perceived challenges of democracies in tackling climate change, such as short-term bias in decision-making and the tendency towards policy capture. And here, let me say something that I feel 
strongly about. This is the time to be bold to reform democracy. The current plight of democracy is showing that institutional designs that in key respects have not changed much in over a hundred years are not meeting the expectations of citizens. This is as good a time as any to imagine new forms of participation and deliberation more attuned to the faster pace, the interconnectedness, the volatility, the dearth of trust, the need to confront obscene inequalities, and the radical urgency imposed by our climate ticking bomb. Those are the traits that define today's world. The status quo is not an option, neither with regards to climate change, nor with regards to the future of democracy. I am looking forward to hearing from our distinguished panelists about their firsthand experience and reflections in response to these important questions. The discussions today will be a valuable reference point to set the direction for international ideas effort on climate change going forward. Our institute looks forward to partnering with member states, democracy organizations, academia, and other like-minded partners, because it is only through concerted actions, global partnerships, exchange of best practices, and innovative methods that we can take this crucial discussion forward. Once again, thank you very much for being here with us on this very proud day for International Idea. I will now ask Dr. Daniel Lindvall to introduce the key conclusions and policy recommendations emanating from this discussion paper. Daniel, you have the floor. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, IDEA. He report, has reported that democracy, global, the global freedom, has been in a negative trend for 13 consecutive years. At the same time, we are going through a climate crisis. NASA, NASA uh, the American Space Agency, has reported that the last decade was the warmest ever. And it's not something that's happening, will happen in the future. It's happening right now. We can experience uh, a series of uh, climate-related emergency uh, crisis, uh, events or natural, dis uh, nature, natural disasters occurring right now. So the question is like, how are these two crises connected? And the report that I'm gonna uh, discuss right now and give, present the my main findings are basically looking at the nexus of these two crises. To what extent is the climate crisis, what, what kind of impact will it have on democracy in the future? And can democracy deal with this crisis? Um, let, let me start to, to show you a picture just very generally uh, showing the, the, the climate effects that, that will happen uh, in the years to come, according to, to um, uh, climate science. We're talking about more extreme weather reports, uh, weather events like heat waves, droughts, floodings, bushfires. And these events will uh, result in social effects like... Uh, increased likelihood of, of, um, of food instability, insecurity, financial instability, uh, conflicts and migration. Altogether, putting a stress on, on, on democ democratic governance. Uh, in the short term, it's, I would say it's quite difficult to say that climate change is all going to result in negative effects for democracy. Some of the effects could be kind of short burning effects that could uh, uh, bring people together, uh, wake them up to, to the reality we are facing, and, and even in some, some countries possibly result in regime change, which could be positive for democratic development. Unfortunately, several of, several of the, uh, um, the effects of climate change will be long lasting result in, um, in the need to, uh, for, for people to move from one area to another when the sea is, is rising, when sea level is rising. Uh, it, will, um, it will possibly bring uh, uh, 
uh, increasing economic inequality due to food insecurity. These are all things which we, we know that it's, it's going to put stress on democratic governance. However, let me just first say that we're going through, <clears throat> we're entering in an uncharted territory. It's very difficult to say what's going to happen. How are humans going to react to these situations? It's, it's very pos positive that we are going to wake up in a situation where people are actually going to take responsibility over the planet, collaborate with each other. Unfortunately, the experience so far has not um, given us an, uh, an experience in that positive direction. I would now just focus on one of the climate effects, which I think is most detrimental for democracy, uh, food insecurity. As you can see on the, on, on, um, the, the left uh, uh, trend here, is the food prices development over uh, the 19th century, uh, 20th century. And we can see that food prices have actually decreased until the, uh, uh, from the 70s to 2011. Um, and this possibly, it's difficult to say, but it could possibly have contributed to a positive democratic trend because it's, been, it's happened <laughs> together with the third democratic wave. Unfortunately, something happened in 2008, 2010, which shifted this trend. Um, it seems to be uh, that uh, in 2010, there was climate-related events in Russia, which caused the yields of wheat to, to uh, decrease with wealth, one would have third in Russia. This had effects uh, on food, food prices which uh, uh, globally, so the, the prices of wheat basically doubled uh, global, globally, which had a, a tremendous effect for North Africa, a region where it's difficult to grow enough food to feed the population. Egyptians are spending about 38% in average on, of the income on food. Um, this increase of food prices had tremendous effects on the population, of course. Together with, other, other, uh, with corruption, police brutality, poverty, unemployment, this factor is put such stress on the population that it had, uh, that it, uh, had a crucial effect on the uprising that we are now, that we call the Arabic Spring. The Arabic Spring could have obviously have been a starting point of the fourth wave of democracy. Um, however, unfortunately, um, the Egypt society seemed to, ha to have difficulties in, in, in bringing this, this, um, this, these events towards a positive development. And according to the IPPC, we, are, um, we could expect food prices to rise to up to about 20 uh, twenty three percent by the mid uh, by twenty fifty if we go on on a business of usual scenario, I would say that this is one of the major uh, challenges to democracy because food is something which is relates to the basic needs of people it's it's therefore extremely connected to uh, the access of freedom for people um, and Obviously, food is something which, is, which is, um, manifests the inequality of the world because the people who will be most affected by food insecurity are the groups or the people around the world that has the least account, or least accountable for the climate change as such. But this is not only something that will affect um, the poor parts of the world. I think this is something that's going to affect also industrialized societies, since food is something that um, that generates uh, inequality. Um, and if food rising food prices would add to a series of of other uh, uh, social problems such as unemployment uh, due to automatization and so on, this will of course be a factor that would change. The social, um, uh, the social structure 
of industrialized societies. So now the question is, can democracy deal with this issue? Well, if we look at this, this picture here, we, we have had quite well established uh, uh, science about um, uh, climate science, uh, the, uh, the climate crisis, for at least three decades. If you look at the graph on the, on the, on the left side, this is basically the, the scientific, the scientific um, um, uh, significance of, uh, of, of the correlation between human emissions and uh, global heating, which has been increasing uh, at the same time as the public awareness uh, of climate crisis has been increasing. During this time, from the establishment of the IPPC, the emissions around the world has uh, increased more uh, than what it had before the establishment of the IPPC. So we emitted more greenhouse gases over the last 30 years mm -hmm. than we did uh, from the time of the industrialization. Obviously, a lot of these emissions happen in authoritarian states. However, it's, it's quite clear that democratic governments have not been able to, to lower their mission um, during this time. There's a few, a few positive examples, but unfortunately right now, we don't have any democracy uh, worldwide that's actually uh, on track with the Paris, uh, with the Paris Accord. Uh, I think we... The question is now, so why is this such a difficult issue for democracies? Well, obviously, energy and freedom are two factors are, that are correlated to a certain extent. Honestly, modern democracy is, of course, having its, its birth in the time of industrialization, when, uh, when we managed to um, to, to understand how to generate uh, energy from fossil fuels. And this is, of course, a paradox and toxic relation, because if fossil fuel, the burning of fossil fuel, was the, was the realizer of, of, public, of, of um, human wealth and development, uh, it also resulted in, in the realize, realizer of human freedom. These curves are very uh, simultaneous, as you can see. At the same time, uh, the uses of, of fossil fuel mm. will be the main uh, threat to democracy. So if democracy are, is going to survive in the long run, we need to, we need to, to sort out the problem of, of how uh, we generate an, uh, uh, energy, of course. And it's obvious that's one of the reasons why democracy have so difficult to, to deal with this problem is that energy uh, that we are so uh, dependent on fossil fuels. Um, however, uh, climate, uh, the climate change is not just any issue. It relates basically to any, any sphere of society since energy, the generation of energy is such a, a, a fundamental aspect of modern society. But to some extent, it's also a matter of how democracy is, the, is, um, is designed and the institution of democracy. I mean, democracy is still, uh, uh, and, uh, is still trapped within the national framework. Mm -hmm. This is a global issue. It's, it's difficult for the democracy don't have the institutional incentives to deal with global issues elected leaders are still responsible to voters on the national level. It is an issue of great complexity. I mean, the, we do right now seem have some, some solutions to it with the development of renewable energy, but still it's a complex, it's, it's, it's massive complexity in the sense that it is, this is an issue that, that's affecting basically all aspects of society. And as Kevin mentioned before, uh, the, the institution of democracy are designed to deal with issues which are short, short term. Uh, governments are elected and, 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 uh, and uh, accountable for, for a mandate which is reaching about four years. 
and while this is an issue which is it's going to affect future generations, the institution of democracy haven't developed uh, a mechanism to deal, to safeguard the rights of freedoms for future generations. And most importantly, uh, democracies have difficulties to fend off, to, to, to deal with uh, interest groups uh, uh, that are uh, such as the fossil fuel industry. It's undeniable that some democracies, especially the United States, have been under huge influence of the, of the fossil fuel industry, which has uh, uh, basically captured the policy, the climate policy of the United States, which is, which is uh, the greatest uh, economy on earth, which is of course uh, a ma uh, 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 one of the main reasons why democracies haven't been able to deliver on this. Um, if you look at this picture, it's generally a picture of uh, where the green, it's, this is the picture of where the greenhouse gases uh, emissions come from from every sector. And if you look at this picture, you can, you can make two conclusions. On the one hand, uh, you can see that the emissions are, are, are emit, uh, uh, the sources of, emitting, of emissions are coming from a, a wide variety of, of, um, of sources. Um, on the other hand, you can also look at it very simplistically and straightforward and say energy is the main source. Energy is the main problem. If we just can, can move from fossil fuels to renewable, we could solve a lot of the problem with, with, uh, uh, with, with, climate, uh, with the climate crisis. Having that in mind, you could make the argument that an authoritarian state would be more efficient in implementing um, uh, and building renewable energy um, um, generations all around, uh, like wind and solar. And there are, of course, some, some proofs to this. If you look at this, uh, this very general picture on, on uh, a wind power installation, you can see that, that China is, is leading, uh, uh, in this, the, leading this game. Um, Almost about a third of, of all global renewable energy is, is installed in China right now. Um, um, in this sense, it seems like if you can have an authoritarian state that don't need to pay attention to interests groups that can, can, be, that can scale up this massive in investment exercise that we are, are approaching, we, they could do it on faster, more rapidly on wider scale while democracies are quite slow on this. Um, the problem is, of course, um, that if you look at it on the other perspective, this is an issue uh, which is um, where you need to have uh, an understanding, a full understanding of how uh, society is affected by various investments. You need to have, uh, uh, since it's a complex problem, you need the, the the policies need to be designed with an understanding of the various side effects for each uh, each policy that you, or each investment you are um, you are undertaking. If you look at if if you look at this uh, issue of wind energy, I think it's it's a very illustrating example. Uh, even though uh, China invested about one hundred thirty nine percent more in renewables in two thousand seventeen than the United States. The investment only rendered in about 38% more energy. Why is this? Well, it's because the investment, the policies were undertaken in a very inefficient efficient way. Mm. Um, wind was constructed in places where there was no major energy demand. And, and um, uh, the, the, the uh, wind power uh, plants were, were built before they were connected to the energy system. It's, it's basically a picture of, uh, uh, of the government not being uh, uh, equipped with an information system where you have civil servants or civil, or civil society organizations who can identify various problems and inform uh, the policymakers by criticizing them in the media or, or holding them accountable in, 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 uh, in the democratic elections. Because democracy is, uh, is, is a system for analyzing and reassessing the effects of policies 
and readjusting policies that are going in the wrong direction. Also, democracy is a system for, for creating a social uh, consensus about the policy. If you can create a social consensus, legitimacy, you will have the full society moving in the, right, in, in the same direction, which is not the case uh, uh, in an authoritarian system where some of these uh, investments were inefficient because there were um, the, the regional governments investing in uh, or undertaking them were not acting in accordance with the policy uh, and in accordance with the, policy, the way the policies were designed on the central level. If you look at gen in general, um, you can, uh, it, an interesting um, assessment of various countries, uh, the policy, uh, climate policies of very count various countries is the Climate Change Policy Index. Um, basically looking at all different states on the, on the efficiency of, of, um, of the climate policy. If you look at, the, um, um, at this, this, this index, you can see that the most of the highest scoring countries are democracies. Um, and there are several studies showing that democracy is a government form that's producing better and more efficient climate policy. However, when you look at this whole series of countries, you can see that there are few exceptions. Exceptions are countries with a high level of corruption and countries with a, with a fossil fuel dependency uh, or higher the fossil fuel dependency than other countries with a fossil fuel industry. Um, showing that these two issues, uh, the functionality of the government, uh, governmental institutions, and uh, the risk of policy catches are the two things that makes democracy, that, 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 that undermines democracy in the, the, in the context of climate policy. To end this, I will just I will uh, round up with the policy recommendations of this report. And I would say that one of the most important things um, for democracies to do, if they're going to unleash un un the potential of democracy in climate change, and they're going to unleash the potential of the climate movement, because climate movement, as Kevin said, uh, can only mobilize and, and grow effective in a democracy where freedom of speech and freedom of association is fully respected. Um, however, we need to find ways to strengthen the state capacity and counteract lobbyism and policy capture. Um, although the lobbying from the fossil fuel industry is not as intensive as it was for a few years ago, it's still there. And I think we're just entering into the last battle of, of fossil fuel right now when with the growing renewable energy industries and the, on the other side. We need to develop knowledge-based decision-making and counteract the inf and disinformation. And I think um, by adopting climate laws and climate uh, a council and advisory boards that could help out in this as, as, uh, respect, I think that will be very helpful for all countries. We definitely need to act on climate injustice and ensure a just transition. Because if the transition is not just, I think we're going to see um, counter reactions um, uh, in groups of the, of, of the population that are either hard hit by climate change or, or losing the, the, the employment uh, in the course of the, of the, of the, of the climate um, and transformation. And this will, of course, uh, impede the, the, the speed of the transformation. Uh, at the same time, I think we need to ensure citizen participation in this whole process in order to have a legitimate and a social consensus behind it. And also to understand that uh, 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 this is not an issue just for experts. We can say, listen to the science, of course, but science will not be able to understand the full complexity of, a so of society. Therefore, we need citizen participation. And finally, we need to overcome short terms by climate laws, emission reduction targets, and a pricing mechanism for emissions. Because I think this is one of the what of, of, of a tool that could, could help society to move in the right direction with a predictability of how um, uh, uh, how the institution will should function to to reduce emissions. 
And especially, as, as Kevin said, uh, with climate laws, we we'll open up for climate litigation. We we'll open up for development where the democracies will be equipped with institutions that also protects the interests of future generations, which is, of course, uh, essential for democracy to be long lasting uh, uh, and for, for us to, to tackle this crisis. I'll end there uh, and uh, I hope we can come back in and discuss the reports all together. Thanks, uh, Daniel. That's been really interesting. Um, my name is Alistair Scrutton. I'm the head of communications at International Idea, and I'll be moderating uh, the next half an hour of discussions with our distinguished panelists. Uh, and thanks, yes, very, it's been a really interesting presentation. It's always great to end on policies and ways forward with these kind of discussions. And that's the really important thing uh, to talk about. Um, I'm going to just moderate then um, a, a discussion. I'm, please uh, put any questions in the chat function of WebEx, and we'll try and answer as many as possible within the short uh, time we have. I'm just going to go through first um, our panelists and just ask them to give a kind of few minutes um, thoughts uh, about Daniel's presentation and their general thoughts on where democracy is going in relation to climate change. Um, and then we'll just have some follow-up questions and, and open it up to a Q&A. Let's um, kick off with um, Dr. Julia Leininger. Please welcome your thoughts. Yeah, uh, thanks, yeah. A thanks a lot. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you so much for this um, inspiring paper that I, I was happy to read before before this launch and, and also the presentation. I think it's a very, it's not only timely, but also a very relevant issue. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to start um, with the policy advice based on, on some evidence, because I think all I can see in terms of policy implications is correct and right, but I think we do need to go one step further. And um, I start with the big pictures and then talk about the implications for governance and, and democracy, I think. So the big picture, what we see in in future scenarios that we um, aim at remodeling or, or model together with um, colleagues from, from the IPCC is that I mean, in these in these scenarios, you have to imagine we look at the status quo and the pathway that leads to a more a sustainable world, right? Which means less climate change. And these pathways in these models don't include neither democracy nor institutions nor conflict. So first indications and analysis show that if we if we add institutions and conflict. And when I say add, I mean projections. If we go from now and if things would just develop how they are developing at the moment, um, climate change might get worse 20 to 40% um, in comparison to the models we know by now. So the situation would be worse if we do business as usual. I think that's a very important message. Then um, with regard the state capacity. I do agree that state capacity is very important. I think the numbers and, and data you showed made that very clear. At the same time, I, I think we need more. Institutions need to be able to transform societies in a peaceful way. So institutions need to be adaptive and, and flexible. And why is that the case? That is the case because we are observing or we are facing fundamental change that will change power in societies and between societies. People have to change their habits and not they don't have to change habits across generations. We don't have time for generations. It's in the next years people have to change their habits and attitudes. And that that will cause conflict. And I do think in all this sustainability research, et cetera, it, it, we have this rather technical um, approaches, pricing, you take a price and then things change. And, but behind that are a lot of conflicts and systems, political systems need to be prepared to tackle these conflicts. And we know that democracies 
are more stable and are able to transform societies in a more peaceful way. And, and democ democracy, per definition, is a system that transforms societal conflict in a more peaceful way than others. I mean, there are conflicts on a, on a low level of, of, of violence. Um, but I do think this is a big uh, advantage of established democracies. But at the same time, since we are facing a world with a lot of autocratization trends, democratic decline, and only in a few countries, democratization, we also have to acknowledge, have to acknowledge that there's a lot of transition and transformation going on. And that as such is a challenge um, for climate change because it, it's it's one part of the overall transformation. So that makes things more complicated, I think. My, se my second policy point is with regard to uh, to the SDGs because what you presented, of course, I mean, it, it was on, on climate change, but it became evident that climate change and tackling climate change is interlinked with many other policy goals, there might be trade-offs uh, with regard to other policy goals. Um, and this is something that is tackled in, in the Agenda 2030 and, and in, in the SDGs. And, I, and we have the Paris Agreement, we have the Agenda 2030, and I think states have, and also societies, made a lot of efforts to, um, to bring these different agendas together. And I do think that is, that is very important and governing interlinkages between goals, policy goals, but also be managing trade-offs between these goals is, is also another capacity that um, flexible institutions and democracies need, need to envisage and need to improve here. So in governing interlinkages, and there is some work out there in the context of the SDGs on that. And my last point, and that's based on an analysis we did on, um, on the SDG, on the guidance that nations provide to implement the SDGs, which is closely interlinked with um, the, the climate development plans as well as societies, is that, that we observe there are a lot of institutions involved, but one thing is missing, and that is accountability. So we looked at parliaments, we looked at... Um, Audits, um, what, uh, yeah, at, at audits and at human rights institutions. And what we see is that that these agendas that um, that have to be implemented by governments, be it SDGs, be it the Paris Agreement, they, these are agendas without teeth because accountability is not foreseen in these national governance systems. So I do think accountability is, and this is something provided by democracies as well, is really an important additional uh, feature uh, for implementing these agendas and tackling climate change. Thanks, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Julia. We're going to, I, I just want to follow up a uh, question from that. I mean, you talked about the importance of you know, changing um, attitudes and behavior. Um, the evidence so far is democracies haven't really, or well, they've definitely had a, a lot of conflict in trying to change that. And you just have to look at the issues of gas prices in the UK, the yellow vests in France. What gives you the idea that, that democracies will be, will have that added advantage of, of changing behavior, of allowing behavior to change? Um, I mean, that wasn't exactly my argument. My argument was that democracies are better equipped to ch to make this change happen in a peaceful way. I mean, there will be societal conflict, but for sure democracies will be able to contribute to a more um, peaceful transformation. But it's it's a tough task, and I'm not sure we can make it in time, even not in democracy. Mm. Thanks. Let's move on. Um to Jan Wahlberg to hear your reaction to Daniels and, and any thoughts uh, moving forward in terms of democracy and climate change. Good afternoon, Jan. Good afternoon, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, really thrilling report and discussions. I think uh, that the two topics we struggle today, like like Kevin said, it's it's, the, it's an existential threat to also the democracy. So as a climate ambassador, I, I think I cannot be but touched by, by what Daniel said. 
also um, I have to mention I was my last posting abroad was in Shanghai in China so it was very interesting comparisons when you make in a way the the, the big topic that that um, why CO2 emission reduction is so difficult for democracies it's because we have been dependent on, on fossils and then including United States so so the whole narrative of, of climate change and democracy I think it's uh, extremely interesting for me uh, I will start from uh, it was actually our Danish colleagues I think who kicked it off and, and, and got the Americas on board and, and and most of European climate ambassadors we call it just transition from fossils to renewables and that's kind of a I think uh, something we need to work together as, as a global community I just saw in Glasgow there will be probably a quite big package for South Africa they have one electricity company ESCOM that that produces 42 percent of the, of the of the emissions just one company in one country and it's because they are using coal industry so so uh or coal power so what we need there is a package for South Africa so we can safeguard the 80,000 uh, working places of the people who directly are employed and the quarter of a million people who are indirectly involved in in, in, in kind of the ESCOM ecosystem so I think uh, that the one big task for for like climate ambassadors and also as, as, a, as a climate community is, is how do we sustain trust transition from fossils to renewables there's also a project in China I think it's led by Denmark we are trying to look for a province where we could cooperate and do that together so so just kind of flag that uh, you also mentioned at least in the report and I think you said it also yes that the kind of problem that climate change is global but democracy is kind of based on nation states and I think that's uh, the big challenge of, 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 of climate diplomacy and, and what we are trying to achieve in Glasgow uh, there are some countries proposing already we should have like-minded countries climate clubs that would go beyond Glasgow I think at the leaders level we'll have something they call uh, Glasgow breakthroughs the idea being kind of that we would have certain sectors like hydrogen and, and, and steel where we could have kind of yearly cycles where we cooperate and, and, and discuss about it so so I think uh, this needs to be overcome this problem of, of kind of a, a democracy not being uh, global because I think uh, like you said climate is glo global and uh, democracy needs to become global uh, perhaps uh, to be brief I want to say something on your recommendations but but one reflection of being a kind of Nordicist climate ambassador I was this morning in a, in a Finnish panel with, with parliamentarians and NGOs it's called the, like Human Rights Council and we were discussing about uh, kind of a gender equality, equality and human rights, and how how only societies where where you have equality, they can beat climate change. And I think it's it's a very much related topic to to democracy. So kind of in my mind, this is a kind of a gender equality, uh, human rights, democracy. I think it's it's one package where I feel that the Nordic countries we 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 can have a role to to to. Kind of the Nordic welfare state 2.1 put put it to 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 kind of the the, the the global threats and then climate change discussions. So I think um, I discussed with my authorities, but but my president he has an idea of 2025 having a conference. He calls it the Helsinki Spirit 50 years after after OSCE, the East and West kind of Cold War division. I think if there is a meeting in, in 2025 with Helsinki Spirit. The core has to be climate change and also in Stockholm the Stockholm 50 process I think you are having uh, preparations for for a meeting in next May I believe so so clearly I think climate change is there all, all very high on the agenda just on on your recommendations fully subscribe I think it's very important things on on on, on kind of climate laws we have in you fit for 55 overcome polarization at least in Finland it's a very difficult topic climate change we have we use peat unlike Swedes here it's it's a and it's a big big topic because it's only like 2,000 people who have their income from peat and it's very not good for climate and how do you make the trust transition so so trying to avoid the national and international polarization uh, discussions you mentioned we need to act on climate injustice I mentioned the trust transition an example of South Africa I think that's clearly something we need to do you also mentioned we need more knowledge-based decision making and increasing state capacity I think there it's again kind of how do we protect human rights and then how it's embedded in our constitutions and how we can kind of bring this this message forward as, as, as Nordic uh, countries uh, 
I will not, I could talk a lot longer, but I think it's good to leave time for discussion. So, so I will stop here with my initial remarks and comments. Thanks, John. Do any, thought, any thoughts though about when you talked about the, the problem of polarization on this debate? Do you think there's signs that that polarization is lessening or increasing from your perspective in the Finnish side of things? Uh, that's a very good question. I think there are like movements in both directions. And I think it's uh, uh, the Finnish discussion, we have a difficult thing because the two government parties that are in government there. And the Centre Party has a very agrarian background, and then you have the Green Party, and then it gets ideological. And I, I think there has been good intents in, in, in going beyond that. And I think that's kind of a, if we succeed that on a national scale, then we can build kind of a Nordic dialogue and then global dialogue. It, it, it can be done because it's a it's an existential threat that, that, that should kind of not uh, polarise us in, in party politics because it's nonsense. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Let's just move on to uh, Elizabeth uh, Watutui. Um, let's hear from you. Um, you have a lot of experience on grassroots initiatives and among youth movement. So it'd be great to hear um, your perspective on Daniel's uh, paper, and as well as your own thoughts about uh, climate change and democracy. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. My name is Elizabeth Watutui, and I'm an environmentalist and a climate activist from Australia and also the founder of the Green Generation Initiative and heading campaigns at Wangari Mazai Foundation. I'd just like to reflect by first mentioning that right now our world seems to be following a kind of a pattern where the more we learn and see about the rate at which climate change is impacting people, the more there is so much to actually worry about. And the climate crisis is definitely impacting democratic governance with so many effects on issues that we've already mentioned, like food security, water crisis, migration, and sometimes the financial implications of the aspect of loss and damage. And the reason why this is happening is because nations promised but failed to deliver and are still failing to deliver. And the implication is that as a result of this inaction, then the most vulnerable people continue to be the most impacted. And what really I always wish for everyone to understand in this space is the aspect of that we are in the same storm, yes, but we are not in the same boat. And the same storm in this case is the climate crisis. Different boats is whereby we have nations that have the least capacity to adapt and the least amount of resources to adapt, despite having contributed the least to the climate crisis. And what is happening is that the impacts of this crisis now continue to escalate, and it is the people that have least contributed, those who even have no historical emissions that continue to suffer from this crisis. So I think it's important for governments to deliver solutions and make sure that their people also are able to recognize and accept the injustices and inequalities that exist when it comes to tackling the climate crisis. This is about delivering fairness, solidarity, and prosperity also to nations that continue to suffer the most but have least contributed. And I'll give a clear picture of where I'm coming from. When I was a baby, my country experienced droughts maybe just once every five or six years. And it was so hard to get up to a rainy season. And even so, communities were able to recover on time. But then by the time I was five, the rains were failing once every two or three years. And I still remember as children, there was so much in the storehouses, enough to store, eat, and even sell, you know, the piles of maize. But now in my early adulthood, the droughts have become relentless. I and mean, in the past year, both of our rainy seasons have completely failed. And with some regions even receiving like 75% less rainfall than they usually would. And scientists say that we have to brace ourselves for at least another 12 months before the rains return again. This is going to mean four failed rainy seasons in two years or back to back. And this is a picture that tells you also that our rivers are running dry, the harvests are failing and the storehouses are standing empty and the people and the animals are also dying. So this heartbreak and the injustice is definitely hard to bear. And even so, there's still a huge extent that is limiting the extent to which people who have even least contributed to the crisis are able to respond to it. 
the policies in place are also very insufficient, even when it comes to protecting future generations and allowing them to be involved in the whole decision making process. So democracies, on the other hand, comprise over half of the nations globally and the quality of their response is definitely going to be key. I personally believe in the power of the people, the power of grassroots communities changing the face of what's happening right now. I have worked a lot with communities, with children, capacity building them, training them how to love nature, to clean their schools and training them on what solutions they can take up to be able to tackle the climate and the ecological crisis. So sparking people into action over the environment gives them confidence to take control over the other areas in their lives, including democracy. So we just need to ask ourselves several questions. How do we get food to people who do not have food? How do we get clean drinking water? How do we get energy? Some of our human activities right now have continued to undermine our capacity to survive on this planet. And the biggest injustice is that there is still that big population that have contributed the most to this problem. But still, we do not see that sense of responsibility, ownership, and doing what is needed to be done and doing the right things based on the capacity of the problem and the contribution to that problem. So I think we need, we definitely do need good governance to face the climate emergency. And good governance to me is about sustainability, is about responsibility, is about accountability for the people on our planet. And that's the same I, I would look at even as we said to COP26. Where is the responsibility? Why is the accountability? And how are we being, uh, you know, how are we making sure that there's sustainability in whatever we are doing? Where is the urgency at the end of it all to ensure that we are responding to the crisis? recognizing the inequalities, the injustices, and the already ongoing loss and damage, even as we continue to discuss about what needs to be done, even when we already know what needs to be done. And the quality of the democratic governance will also be the determinant of whether or not our systems are going to work. So if we do not have good governance, then our planet is going to lose out, and we will also lose out in the end. And I do know that everything requires a democratic space, and I think we'll agree with you on this. And I'll just like to slightly uh, end on a different note that you cannot protect the environment if you are in a system that does not allow its citizens to also participate in decision making. And sometimes all of these issues become complicated with the way our systems are run and the way we continue to hold people responsible for what they have done to contribute to the crisis and what they are doing right now to be able to kind of have, uh, to be able to really uh, respond and cover up and be accountable and held accountable for what they have contributed. And I just end with uh, something from the late of Sangara Matai. She talked a lot about the link between governance and everything else that is surrounding us today. And she gave an example of the African school. Sangara Matai was the first African woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize. We have not heard of her. And she was a leader that I always really draw so much inspiration from that I wish every other leader would take up such traits from her, like courageous leadership. She gave an example of the Africans too, that had three legs, and then the three legs would hold the basin where you sit on. And each of the legs represented three pillars. And that's what the first one was peace, the second leg was governance, and the third one was good management of our resources. So we can never separate three things, uh, these three things if we are to make a difference or an impact when it comes to tackling the climate and the ecological crisis. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Elizabeth. Um, thanks very much, it's great to hear it from your perspective there. Um, we only um, have uh, a short time, so I'd like to bring in some questions that we've had from, from the audience um, to each of the panelists. Um, one, one question which I think addresses what um, was being talked about in the panel is um, one question is, do global challenges such as climate change require more effective and accountable global governance? Do we need steps towards global democracy, perhaps focused on climate initially, like an advisory parliamentary assembly at the UN? Um, Julia, what are your thoughts about that? Sorry, I was distracted because I tried to read the um, 
to read the question, so I didn't didn't pay attention to the wording of the question you posed. Could you please repeat it? No, it was essentially a question about um, do we need to take steps towards global democracy um, focused on climate change, like an advisory parliamentary assembly at the United Nations? Yeah, so that was the first question that I was looking at as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what becomes evident here in this whole discussion is that that we do need, as SDG 16 poses it as well, as well um, inclusive governance, or let it be democracy, from a global to a, to a local level. And there were, in 2005, the last, I would say, real attempt to reform the UN, there were these discussions on a, on a global parliament. And here, yeah, I would say the same. If there is a parliament that has just an advisory function and no teeth and can hold nobody, accountability, no, nobody accountable, um the laws won't be implemented and that would be my argument or like an answer to jan and and also one of the recommendations i mean we have a lot of laws but then we have an implementation um gap as well of, of implement implementing these laws and we do need strong civil societies and and institutions that hold governments accountable for that. But what I do think where one should strengthen a global governance and the UN system is really with regard to uh, human rights. I mean, the last resolution now on making the right to a, a protected environment a human right, uh, the resolution from the Human Rights Council, I think that is something that has to be taken serious and that has a close link to democracy on a global level. So thinking about integrating um, um the idea of democracy and, and and the human rights and human rights closer also in, in the un system that's really important also on a national and regional level because these are two communities we have a human rights community a governance and a democracy and conflict community but they don't speak to each other and i think that type of integration would be really important thank you jan what are your thoughts on this question of uh, global governance and Julia's thoughts. Uh, pretty much on the same lines. I think we have all seen like like the intents of of, of uh, reforming the UN system. It's 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 uh, difficult. One important step is that Julia mentioned already the, 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 the right to 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 we call it the Finnish healthy environment. But, but what they just decided and it's going now to the General Assembly. And I think we need to follow very carefully. Do we get like legally binding or non legally binding instruments there? So, so there are processes within the EU. And I mentioned in my first in intervention this idea it's a big European country who proposed a climate club. And I think, in a way, when I look at the kind of climate ambition, when we talk about how do we keep 1.5 within degrees and then how, how countries have to put their na nationally determined contributions. Last country this weekend was Saudi Arabia promising they will become climate neutral 2060. I think it's becoming kind of a global movement that, that, that we are realizing that, that in order to fulfill what science tells us and keep 1.5 within reach, we need to make compromises and, and, and also politics, not just promises. So I think there might be a way of, of, of kind of uh, having a coalition of the willing that, that becomes larger and larger. And I think uh, democracies are quite easy to attract to that. And then I think once you get the critical mass, it, it might become more and more global movement. So, so some kind of a, just a working title, like a climate club that, that, that aims for, for keeping 1.5 degrees alive. There is, a, I think UK asked Denmark and Granada, Granada how do you say in English? But, those are the two countries who are thinking that how do we do this trick of, of keeping 1.5 alive. So let's see if the Danes and the Granadinians, they, they come up with some ideas. Thanks. Elizabeth, how do you see all that idea of kind of global change fitting in with the need of democracy to connect with uh, the youth movement? Do you think enough is being done with that? Um, and do you see um, moving forward from what you're hearing in, with COP26, et cetera, that democracies are, are listening to the youth to kind of implement these kind of changes? I would say to begin with, still not got into a point where we recognize the global inequalities that exist and the injustices that we need the global form of responses right now. And what needs to happen right now is the fact that even if you look at the representation of the people 
that are the most impacted by the crisis are still not at the top of schedule right now. Countries like those in Sub-Saharan Africa are not only you know, fighting for accountability, but it's also about representation, having their voices heard, having them in the room, which means that we have still not recognized those inequalities because unless we bridge the gap on inequalities first, then even that global governance is not going to work because it needs for people to understand that we all have different challenges right now. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, uh, countries, for example, in Western Africa had to deal with both the climate crisis impact and also the COVID-19 pandemic. And we saw the vaccine inequalities happening all around the world. It's still happening. There are countries in Africa that still have just about 3% of people vaccinated. There are those that are still going to struggle to go to COP28 because they are not vaccinated and all of those issues. So it's about the recognition of those inequalities if the aspect of global governance is going to work. But until the inequalities are addressed and the root causes of climate change as well are addressed, then it is going to be impossible to really uh, move forward uh, with this. But I think that would be the first point of reference to recognize the inequalities and then bridge the gaps because it's beyond the aspect of, you know, it's even beyond the aspect of when you talk about economic finance. It's beyond uh, the aspect of saying that we need to finance, for example, adaptation and mitigation for countries that are the most affected. Do we even recognize that some of these uh, commitments that we set ourselves to do not recognize uh, historical emissions? For example, the net zero commitments, there is no historical emissions, for example. So if all of these aspects recognize the injustices and the inequalities that have gone into the climate crisis, then it's going to be possible to harmonize and then bring in all these global solutions. And that's the same reason why uh, we see some of these uh, things not changing. Right now, the nation's trying to get themselves out of commitments they made before. Why? Because they are trying to address their local problems or challenges, for example, through what they term as local solutions that still continue to impact people that are the most impacted by the climate crisis. So I think there's supposed to be a huge balance and recognition of the inequalities. And then once the inequalities, gaps and injustices are addressed, then it's going to be very easy for the world to adapt to that kind of global governance. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, we are actually moving towards the end time flies. Um, I would like to actually, um, before Kevin gives his closing remarks, um, I'd just like Daniel to give perhaps your final thoughts. Um, I'd just like to add one thing, because you, your paper talks um, a lot about this issue of a wicked problem, that climate change is, is a wicked problem in the sense it's, what you mean by that, I presume, is that it's just so complex in terms of this mixture of natural and human systems that no one really knows how to deal with that. What is your thoughts, um, finally, about both what the, the panelists have been saying and this issue is whether democracy can deal with wicked problems. Thanks. <clears throat> well, I just uh, uh, as a closing remark on the on the question about uh, like a global democracy, if that is needed, I, I don't think I don't think that's uh, needed. I think uh, we need to understand it's very. We need to focus on on climate change as a global issue. We need to have. We need to to hopefully there will be things happening on, on in Glasgow that could. Uh, that we keep alive the uh, the uh, the the aims of one point uh, uh, one and a half degree uh, of, of increase of of, of of temperature. However, and and we also need to focus on on the green fund. But however, I think what's happening with 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 the with the climate the issue of climate change right now that is it's to some extent is changing the logic of climate change. It's not. I mean, if we are going to solve this, we need to solve it from from underneath uh, with cooperation of willing democracy, as you as Jan was talking about the club of um, a climate club. Uh, because I think I think um, uh, one important factor of this is is the development of renewable energy, which is extremely important in this sense because it changes the the logic in the sense that before we've always seen that if. If some, if China is emitting a lot of, of, of greenhouse gases, there's no need for us to do anything. That's basically been like a mantra of people, you know, uh, opposing climate uh, action. But with renewable, we could see that actually this, this, we have all reasons to, 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 uh, to do the climate transfer here because it's, it's, it's beneficial in so many other ways. It's not only about climate effects. It's also beneficial for our economy. It's beneficial for our 
living standards for for the uh, for for air standards and so on. So basically, we I think climate change is changing from just being an issue, which is a global complex issue. It's a, it's a, the, the driving forces for transformation can be can happen on the local level, and this is changing the context of climate change to some extent. Um, and this relates also to the matter of, of wickedness, because I think, yes, climate change is a wicked problem uh, in the sense that, it's, um, that it's, 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 it's complex because it's a problem that is connected uh, with all spheres of society. If we're trying to, let's say, we're going to change the, 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 the transportation sector from, uh, from electrifying cars, we, will, we end up problems with... We're searching for for rare minerals and so on, so we create other environmental problems. This is this is one aspect to it, and that's one of the reasons why we need democracy. And I think this is this is what a wicked problem is. But we can also talk about a wicked possibility because everything we try to do with uh, with uh, uh, climate mitigation will have it will have side effects that are negative, but a lot of those side effects are also positive. They are positive in the sense that, as I said, uh, energy independence is very positive for, for a government, for, for a country like Sweden, not being reliant on, on energy which is supplied by autocratic, non-democratic states. Uh, renewable energy can even like make, uh, can also be helpful for democracy because it it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, strengthens the powers of local communities if, if they can control the energy generation. So basically, a wicked problem has two, two sides of it. It's a wicked possibility and it's a wicked problem. So, I mean, if we, if we get on with this, I think uh, the transformation, we could also see a lot of positive effects of, of, uh, of, uh, of this transformation. We could be very fruitful for democracy. But in that case, we need to start act right now and not hoping for a global democracy to happen, but working within democracies and together with democracies, climate clubs or something like that, European Union with, with <laughs> carbon, with a carbon trade and a, uh, some kind of a, uh, um, um, a border uh, adjustment policy as well. So that's, that's, uh, that would be my positive take on it. Thanks very much, uh, Daniel. Um, thanks very much for your paper. We are now, um, thanks very much, panelists. And uh, now we'll have uh, closing remarks from Kevin. Uh, thank you, Alistair, and thank you, Daniel, and thank you to our three wonderful panelists. Uh, well, I don't know if for you, but for me, this has been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. And let me just add, I can't resist the temptation of adding a few, a few thoughts to this very thick stew. Um, and I would like to, to start those thoughts with, a, with the policy recommendations, because this is the, the angle through which IDEA is is trying to approach this issue. I mean, we help countries uh, enhance and improve their institutions, or that's what we claim we do. So uh, this is what we are trying to do in getting headfirst into this discussion. Because ultimately, this is, this is actually very concrete when we talk about the policy recommendations that can stem from this discussion. I mean, if we, if we talk about the need to overcome a short-termism that is endemic in democracy, we're thinking, for instance, and we need to talk about the role of constitutions in enshrining incentives towards incorporating the long term uh, into policy making. If we think about overcoming short termism, we're thinking about uh, decisions like whether to lower the voting age so as to give a greater voice to young people into the policy process, which is something that countries like Austria and Malta have done in the recent past. 
If we think about enhancing citizens' participation in this, in this discussion, then we need to discuss, we need to have a, a discussion about the role of randomly selected citizens' assemblies in crafting environmental policy, which is something that Ireland has done among other countries. If we talk about confronting the tendency of democracies uh, 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 towards uh, uh, falling into policy capture, then we're thinking about, and we need to talk about, regulating the role of money in politics, including the deleterious role that lobbying activities play in this kind of discussion. If we think about having more science-based policies, then we need to talk about whether it's a good idea or not to establish advisory boards and councils that inform with science the policy-making decisions that a government makes, which is something that a country like Finland has done. So this is very concrete. I mean, this is not abstract. I mean, we're talking about very concrete policy options, institutional options that stem from this discussion. And that's what that's the kind of discussion that we want to stimulate a, 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 from a, the vantage point of, of idea. But let me let me add a final a final point, which is connected to something that Julia uh, mentioned, and, and then in some ways uh, came up in the course of the of the discussion uh, at different times, which is the question of the need. If we're going to be successful in decarbonizing societies, we need to talk about changing habits, uh, and including at the local level, which is something that Elizabeth uh, uh, spoke about at some length. And, and here is where the question of how you need to build consensus in order to change habits becomes Fundamental. I mean, I, 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 we have the tendency to think that decarbonization is something that governments do by decree. Well, no, decarbonization is something that societies do out of conviction. Otherwise, it won't happen. And that's where democracy is much better. I mean, this kind of, of changes in habits and attitudes of deeply seated uh, uh, attitudes and habits uh, is much better done in a democratic setting than in an authoritarian setting. I mean, think for instance, and here I'm going to, to give a, uh, an example from a, an entirely different uh, uh, field, but I, that I think is relevant to this discussion. I mean, think about the, the process. I mean, think about the case of the the process of rapid authoritarian westernization undergone by Iranian society in the 1970s. That was something that was done in a very efficacious way, but that ultimately failed because in an authoritarian setting, there, are, there is always a counter reaction to this kind of rapid a change in, a, of attitudes imposed from above. Think even of the case of Turkey. I mean, the process of westernization done in Turkey by Ataturk back in the day, it took decades, but the deeper currents of society ended up rearing their heads in what we're seeing currently in Turkey. So my point is that Changes in attitudes and habits imposed from above by force ultimately fail. This is something that democracies are much better at. Think on the other, on the other side of the changes in the attitudes towards sexual identity or towards women's rights that has been achieved in, in Western societies, for instance. This is not something that has been done by force, but is proving much more sustainable in the long run. So this, this is, I think, one of the key 
attributes of democracy. And by the way, if we talk about consensus, we need to talk about one of the issues that was raised by Jan, which I think by Jan and by others in the course of this discussion, I mean, the term just transition. I mean, what we are really talking about here is the reality that fighting climate change is a huge, huge distributional issue. It's a distributional issue across generations and it's a distributional issues between industries. So the question is, which system is better equipped to build consensus to deal with such a thorny, multi-pronged distributional issues? I have no doubt that whatever the shortcomings, democracies are better equipped to deal with that sort of challenge. The question, of course, and it's a question that pervades this whole discussion, is whether uh, we will get there on time. The question of the speed is, is, is the really tricky part in this discussion. In terms of the merits of the case, I have no doubt that the case for democracy to be able to deal with these issues is much stronger than, than the alternative. But the question is whether we will get there on time. And with that, I want to finish by saying that all these issues require a lot more research and a lot more thinking and a lot more debate. And this is exactly what we intend to do from International Idea. And I must thank Daniel uh, in a very warm way for launching us forth into this, into this process. It is a process that I think is going to be fascinating and that I'm extremely excited to be a part of. And I hope you will be too and that you will join us in this very interesting adventure that we're launching today. Thank you all for joining us today and I hope to see more of you in the future events and the future uh, activities that we organize at International Idea.